people are a visitor. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to make certain all of our visitors are aware of the JAM program. Each Sunday morning uh, during the sermon period, we have a class that's for our children, ages three to the third grade, and they're welcome to come forward right now. Bobby will be leading them in a song, and, and uh, they're going to have a marvelous class while the sermon period is going on. I was ready for all the other verses there, Bobby. <laughs> Hide it under a bushel. No! <laughs> Hope they have a great time. Great time back there. They got a regular parade going on there. It's good to see. Is it good to see all those little children? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's marvelous, marvelous. And, and since we have so many good little children here this morning, I'm going to talk about children. Actually, I'm going to talk about parenting. I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks, in fact, talking about God is seeking parenting heroes. And I'm going to talk about exactly how, how you and I might become parenting, or in some of your cases, grandparenting, uh, he, he, heroes. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul, in writing to the young preacher, encouraged him to continue uh, in the things that he had learned and firmly believed in, knowing from whom you had learned it, and how from a child you had known the sacred scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. He makes clear exactly how Timothy got to be the great man of God that he had become. He was the man of God that he was because he had learned from his childhood and from his parents those things that made him great. And he says that from your childhood... You have known the scriptures. There's only one way that happens, brethren, and that's because somebody was teaching them. And that's the marvelous outcome with Timothy. I want that for each one of our young people. I want every one of our children to grow up, to be like this Timothy. And it'll happen because from a childhood, they have been nurtured and they have been brought along in the word of God and in the encouragement of faith and becoming men just like him. From a child, it says, that he had learned these things. I can actually tell you specifically who Paul gives credit to. Parenting heroes such as found in 2 Timothy chapter 1. As Paul began that letter to Timothy, he said, I thank God for you, and then he continued saying, And I remember your sincere faith, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now it indeed indwells you. I want you to notice the fact that it wasn't just simply they brought him to church. It wasn't just simply that they made certain he showed up for Bible class or that he had the right clothes on. And it certainly wasn't that he made certain they made it on the baseball team or on the football team or on the uh, school academic records. It was because they instilled within him the same faith that he had. Or that, she, that they had, excuse me. Notice what he says. I'm remembering your sincere faith, but Timothy... Where did you find that faith? Where did it dwell at before it dwelt in you? It was in your mother, and for those of us that are grandparents, in your grandmother. They instilled that faith. They didn't just talk about it. They didn't just see to it that somebody else was teaching them, but rather that they instilled their faith in him. We're right now in the midst of discussion. Spent time in the class today talking about hiring 
a young family and youth minister. The elders are seeking that out. And I assure you, their intent is to have that accomplished within a matter of a few months, that we'll have him here and on board. But understand this, that whatever he brings to the table, and I have told them, I hope he comes with far more ideas than I've ever had about how to encourage our young people. But be assured of this. He's not the one who needs to instill his faith in them. But rather, as Paul said, it wasn't the youth minister or the preacher. It wasn't even Paul himself. It was, in fact, his mother and his grandmother. It didn't just bring him to church. They made certain that their faith was instilled in him. His mother and grandmother were parenting heroes. And I say even his mother or grandmother was a parenting hero because if you're engaged in your grandchildren's lives or your nieces and nephews or whatever the case, maybe in some of your cases, great-grandchildren, you are in fact parenting them. And I so much want your faith to be instilled in them. And I hope and my pray, and speaking of prayers, by the way, you and I need to be praying diligently every day at every meal. When you're thanking God for the food, you talk to God about the man that we're going to wind up bringing here and, and potentially, I guess, his wife as well and kids or whatever, but praying for them that God will prepare that young family and youth minister to be the man of God that we need him to be and that he will help guide us to become parenting heroes. But whether you're a parent literally or a grandparent or a great-grandparent, if you're trying to instill your faith into those little ones, you're a parenting hero. God's plan for instilling such faith is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 and following. It is a marvelous plan that I'm confident that both Lois and Eunice, Timothy's parent and grandparent, we're fully aware of this. It is called the Shema of the Old Testament. It is the declaration of what God wants for His people. And it's no, no less true today than it was when Moses penned this some several thousand years ago, 1,500 years ago anyways. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be on your, in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on your doorposts. And on your house. And on your gates. And on your mailbox. And on the walls of your house. And on your Facebook page. And in every single way that you can, you're going to be instilling your faith into the hearts and minds of your children and your grandchildren. Let's consider this text then. As you can see, I've underlined some points. This is the focus of this morning's sermon. If you are going to become parenting heroes, it'll be because you've implemented the very things that we're about to see that Moses admonished his people, God's people, in the long ago. Notice, first of all, he says it starts with parents and grandparents having their own hearts right with God. You cannot give your children that which you do not have. You cannot instill within the hearts of your children and grandchildren a faith and devotion to God that you yourself do not possess. And so, first of all, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might, having your heart right with God, loving God with all of your heart. That is, in fact, a single mandate of a relationship with God. Loving Him with all of your heart. God wants many things from us, but before He wants anything from us, He wants our heart. He wants our love. So you, if your heart is right with God, will be able to give that to them. As I said, Paul told Timothy, but the faith that you've got in you dwelt first in your mother and your grandmother. So also, if you have a love for God, you need to instill that in them. And it won't be just simply because they know the right way to sing or because they know uh, the, the issues of baptism or the Holy Spirit or, or whatever biblical topic you want to teach. You have to teach those things. But the first thing they need to see from us is our love for God. If all we do is sit around the dinner table on Sunday afternoon to complain about the song leader, or to complain about the preacher or the elders or the whatever in the world, if that's what they're hearing, they're not hearing 
your love for God. Make certain that every conversation around every dinner table, around every morning devotional, around every evening devotional as you put them to bed is about how much you love God. For indeed, if our heart is not right, we can't guide theirs. We need to, they need to see our faith and our devotion not just being spoken of, but also lived out in our lives because parents without devotion to God will not convince their children to be devoted to God. Parents who sin and shame God in front of their kids will never be able to convince their kids that Jesus is the most important thing in their life. Parents who never will never convince their kids that church is the most important thing and a relationship with God is the most essential thing if the parents themselves do not hold it as the most important and essential thing. So what is loving God with all your heart? Here's what I know. If we love God with all of our heart, it's like signing a blank check and giving it over to God. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the contribution. I'm talking about your life. That you write a life check to God. And the amount that's in there is blank because He gets it all. Let Him write in what it was He is He wants. Now, you would never want to do that with a plumber or with a mechanic or with an IRS agent. but I wouldn't trust them with a blank check. But my friend, you can trust God with your blank check. That's what you and I need to do, is to trust God with all of our heart. There's a, a beautiful song out that I've been paying attention to recently. I, I, I think it says, I will trust in you. I think that's the title of it. It may not be, but in any case, in the song, Lauren Daigle sings about the fact that when the mountains don't move that I've asked you to move, I will still trust in you. And when the waters don't part so that I may walk through, I'll still trust in you. That's what I'm saying. That you and I need to have our trust in Him with all of our heart. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, Jesus said that whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It just can't. And so you and I need to write God this blank check. Lord, everything I have, everything I am is yours. Use me. And I'm telling you, if your kids are convinced that that's the way you feel about God, they'll get a glimpse of how they should feel about God. So is your heart right with God? Is your heart filled with God's word? For indeed, it needs to be. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6 again. Moses wrote, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Not just simply on your TV set. Well, it used to be a time when the TV set was a box, but you can't lay it on your flat screen. But anyways, it used to be the Bible's laid on the TV. Y'all remember those days? Some of the older folks have the TV and the Bible's laying there. The Bible's not just meant to be laying on your nightstand or your TV. It's meant to be in your heart. The words that I command you today shall be on your heart because it's so valuable. I was watching Pawn Stars this week, uh, one episode. I, I really enjoy that, okay? So this is my advertisement for Pawn Stars. But anyways, in it, the guy brought in a copy of the Gutenberg Bibles. Let me rephrase that. One page of the Gutenberg Bible, which was printed back in the 14, about 1455, I think. In the original print press, he was the guy that invented the printing press. And, and uh, Gutenberg had printed Bibles, and in that time frame, there were several printed. This guy brought in one page of one of those Bibles and wanted to sell it to the pawn shop. And the, the guy that's the star of the show asked him, the pawnbroker, said, how much do you want for it? And he said, I want $65,000. And I thought, man, you're crazy. You're crazy. And so the guy that's the star of the show, he said, let me get an expert in here to tell us what it's worth. And he did. And the guy came, looked at it, and his eyes got great big. And when they asked him how much that one page was worth, he said, well, one sold an auction for $80,000 this year. $80,000, one page of God's Word. I'm telling you, God's Word is worth far more than any $80,000. Okay, I'll say it again and give you a second chance. God's worth, the Word is worth far more than $80,000.
There you go, brethren. And we need to get it into our hearts so we can get it into their hearts. It is the purpose of why we're trying to bring another man here to help in the work is because he's going to help bring God's word into your hearts and into theirs. Secondly, Deuteronomy chapter 6 goes on to say in verse 7, that you shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the way and when you lay down and when you rise up. Basically, you should be talking about God's word, God's stuff, God's thoughts, God's goals all the time. It ought to be on your work, on your voice, and talking with them. Sure, they need to get their homework done. Yes, they need to clean their room. And it is time to take out the trash. But make sure you preface every one of those commands with God loves you. And you quote a scripture to them. You talk to them about God's word. Teach them diligently to your children and talk about them. On the way to church, on the way home from church, you talk about them. Mother was dealing with a fidgety seven-year-old child in the auditorium one day. They apparently did not have a jam program in that church. And the child was fidgeting around, and Mama looked down at him and said, Timmy, if you don't be quiet, the preacher's going to lose his place in that sermon, and he's going to start the whole sermon over again. That quick, that boy was silent like this. And I'm telling you, you bring your children to church so they can hear God's Word and learn God's Word, and maybe they're not picking up all of it. It's the reason why we have the JAM program, to make it an educational moment for them. But I'm telling you, long before we had the JAM program, we had children in this auditorium who were writing down every scripture. Not, not the little, little ones, but the ones that could write. were writing down every scripture I brought up. And they, they would give it to me afterwards. They were so proud. They would come up to me. I, Audrey was one of them. There was others, but Audrey was one of them. And she would bring it up to me and show it to me like she would just accomplished something great. And you know what? She would just accomplished something great. And whether she understood a word of what I said, she knew what every scripture I preached on was. I'm just telling you, we need to get the word of God taught. And it's not my job to teach your children. And before God, brethren, it's not a youth minister or a family life minister's job to teach your children. It's yours. Now, you may use him to help you. You can use me to help you do that. But it's, it's your job to teach them to your children. Psalm 119, the psalmist wrote in the long ago, with my whole heart I seek you. And here's the evidence. With your, my whole heart I seek you. So let me not wander from your commands. Do you notice that? Seeking God and not wandering away from God's word are tied together. He goes on to say, and I store up your word in my heart, watch this, so that I might not sin against you. You want to keep your kids out of trouble? I mean, serious trouble? You want to be teenagers and college age students who know that they should not be having relationships, sexual relationships with people before they're married? You want them confident that they need to deal with moral issues and with life issues with a spiritual mind? then you and I need to make certain that they know God's word long before they get there. And you and I will teach them to. He says, teach it diligently. Look at that word. You see that word diligently. That doesn't mean in a passing way. It means diligent. You do something diligent, that means you're doing it all the time and you're doing it with fervor and excitement and with joy because you're doing it diligently. It's this process of making them disciples. And so in Matthew 28, when Jesus gave the great commission, he told the disciples, you go into all nations, uh, or baptize people in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says this, and you teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. That's what we're doing. We're making disciples. He said, go make disciples of every nation and baptize them. That's what you and I are doing. As parents, as grandparents, we're making disciples. And you know where those disciples are at? They're sitting uh, in, 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 in your kitchen or in your dining room at the table with you. They're your children. They're your grandchildren. Disciple them. Teach them God's word. And then teach them to obey all things that I've commanded you. It's a group effort. Thirdly, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses went on to say, And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. He even gave them the moments when they're supposed to do it. Now, how many we got listed there? Let me see. There's one, two, three, four. 
That means there's four times a day that you should have a Bible study with your children. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I do want you to think about it. How many in the room have had Bible studies with their children four times a day? There's my point, okay? And again, it's you doing it and not somebody doing it for you, but rather it's you doing it. Conversations with them about God's stuff. It's not a structured class, you see. He's not talking about sitting down with them, uh, though you should sit down with them as they're going to bed and have a little devotional with them, but it's just talking when you're walking around. You're in the kitchen working on the eggs for breakfast and talking to them about how great Jesus is that he gave us these eggs. Whatever it is, you're just talking about God in a positive way at all times. Discussing it with them. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man, or for that matter, the mama. Blessed is the man and the mama who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of a scoffer. But rather, here's what he does. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. It's a continual thing, you see, not just a random every once in a while thing. You and I need to bring them to Bible class and teach them the Word. Fourthly, the next thing Moses says in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 8 is you shall bind them. That's the Word of God, the commands of God. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. I'm telling you, on your hands. Talking about, I don't know, tattoos? I don't know if that's what he's referring to here. But he is certainly saying it needs to be on your body. It needs to be on your clothes. It needs to permeate out of your face. You need to look like you love Jesus. All right now, everybody all at the same time. Look like you love Jesus. <laughs> Amen. There you go. Put a smile on your face and look like you love Jesus. That's what he's saying here. He's talking about that you and I would make certain that we have personal and private reminders for ourselves about how precious Jesus is to us. It is the purpose of a wedding band. The reason for a wedding band is to be a personal reminder. I don't wear this band for you. Well, for all the cute women that might want to... That deserves restating. For all the cute women that want to chase after me, my ring is on my finger and that should be a symbol for them to say, no, you can't. But at the same time, it's not for them. This is a private and personal thing for me. It reminds me continually of my devotion for my wife and the promises that I've made. It is, in fact, the token of that promise that I just threw away and discarded. Some people do that with marriage, you know. But anyways, but it's meant to be a continual reminder to me so that I don't forget the man I'm supposed to be, the husband I'm supposed to be. And it's kind of neat that she wears something like that too to remind her of the woman she's supposed to be, the wife she's supposed to be. But that's the idea of what the, the Moses is saying here, that you're going to write this on your hands, you're going to have it on your clothes, you're going to have these personal reminders. I used to carry a penny in my pocket, a, a literal Lincoln head penny, that had punched through it a cross. It had an open cross in it. It was punched through it by some press. I carried it in my pocket. Every time I pulled change out of my pocket, I saw that penny and was reminded again of whose money that is. It belongs to God. You and I need personal reminders on a regular basis. It is what communion is about, is to be a regular reminder of who we're about and whose we are. We need those reminders. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, talking about the memorial for Jesus' cross, says that it's meant to be a reminder, a memorial of what He has done. So bring your kids every week to witness and hear what we witnessed and hear this morning. You notice the fact that when we do the jam program, we don't take the kids out right after the announcements. You know why we don't take the kids out right after the announcements? Because they need to see what's going on in here. They need to see the singing and the smiling faces of their mommies and daddies and their grandparents as they're singing songs of praise to God. They need to see us bowing our heads and praying before God. And they need to see us remembering what Jesus has done. And so we don't take them out until Cliff gets up because, well, it's just the best time to take them out the door. But anyways, 
Number five and finally, make your faith a public faith. It is supposed to be a private thing. You do things privately, but notice what else he says. Deuteronomy 6, verse 9. Write them upon your doorposts, upon your house, of your house, and upon your gates, and on your mailbox, and on your walls, and on your mirrors in the kids' bathroom, and that you write them on your Facebook page, and you, you just make sure that it's everywhere in your life. Make your faith a public faith in action. Family with a public statement. We're Christians in this home, and that's what we are in every way that you can do it. A family with a public statement. Reminds me of the ten plagues about the doorposts, putting the Word of God on the doorposts. Why would you put it on the, on the, on the doorposts? That's what he says, and on your gates. Why do you want it over the doorpost of your house? That's got to be reminiscent of what happened in the book of Exodus when God had the Israelites to paint uh, blood of a lamb on the doorposts so that when the evil death angel passed over, he wouldn't go in that house. Do you know why he wouldn't go in that house? Because that house belonged to God. That's why. And there was, door, there was, paint, there was blood on the doorpost to prove it. Maybe that's the reminiscent thing that Moses is referring to here when he says, you need to write God's word on your doorposts and on your gates. Just put it everywhere because it's a public statement. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 when He said, You are the light of the world. And then He says this in verse 16, Even so, let your light shine before men so that they'll see your good works. Well, I think this is neat. He says so that men will see your good works. It's so your kids will see those good works too. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, your Father who is in heaven. That, my friends is a vocal, verbal, visual faith that the kids can't miss if you'll present it to them. I want you to be parenting heroes. God is seeking parenting heroes. We're going to hire a guy that's coming with the plan to help you be a parenting hero. I hope you accept him to do that. I hope you use him until he's worn out doing that very thing, helping you to become parenting heroes hero because that is what God is looking for and it starts it starts with what Moses said Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 6 here's where it starts thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all my heart with all my mind with all my might and all my strength you love the Lord your God if you're struggling with that this morning and perhaps you've even failed miserably in it this might be the right time for you to do things right with God now if it's a personal thing you can talk to God right where you're at but if you've sinned in a public way, you need to talk to God publicly about it. And if, in fact, you've never become a Christian, I invite you to come to Jesus and learn of a love story that will change your life. You come as we stand and sing. I wander far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The past sin too long I've trod Lord I'm coming home coming home coming home never more to roam open wide thine Now I'm coming home.
my soul is sick, my heart is sore. Now I'm coming home, my strength renew, my hope restore. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord. I want to give you a couple encouragements. The first one is, is that we're going to have, we've, we're bringing in a guest speaker tonight for our devotional period. We brought in a dynamic guy. It's going to do a great job and encouraging. No, it's not me. It's, it's somebody else. But we got a guy we're bringing in. You're going to be in for a real tree. Uh, it's Brody Brewer, one of our young people in the church. He's going to be leading the devotional tonight. I hope you come and hear what he has to say. Also, a couple assignments. I want you to take your children and grandchildren, whatever, as they've left the JAM program over lunch today, ask them what they learned. Ask them to tell you about it. Ask them to teach you what they just learned and, and see what they have to say. I, I'm reminded of a, of a mama who was asking her child about Bible class that day. The teacher had asked the children to draw a picture uh, of some story in Jesus, of Jesus, their favorite story. Well, the picture that little Timmy had drawn, it's always Timmy, isn't it? Anyways, little Timmy had drawn this picture, and Mama said, what is that? And he said, that's Jesus' flight to Egypt. It was a picture of an airplane with four people on it. That was Jesus' flight to Egypt. And she said, well, okay, the four people, let me see. The, uh, one of them's Mary, and the other one's Joseph, and the other one's Jesus. But, but who's the fourth one in the picture? And he said, well, that was Pontius, the pilot. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I didn't create that joke, okay? I, it's not mine. But anyways, uh, there was something else. I know what it was. Whoever's leading the closing prayer today, please, uh, please pray diligently about our search for a new man to come in to work with our young people and, and, youth, and young families. And, and, and pray both for his health for his, uh, and for his coming, and that we'll find him, and that and he'll have a safe uh, arrival with us to bless his work. We need, and by the way, parents and, and grandparents and everybody else in the room, every day, please pray about this, okay? It's a pretty big, not just life-changing, but church-changing event as well. This may make the difference between a future and not a future. Let's pray about it. There's a couple things I'd like to add to Cleos. I want to thank everyone that came out this morning and participated in the class on us looking and reaching out for a family, a, a youth family minister and, and uh, young, young people. We really appreciate the input, uh, desire your input. It was a great lesson that Cliff brought today. Everybody, especially our young people, they notice what you do on a daily basis. They know exactly if you're doing the right thing or if you're not doing the right thing. Believe me, I know. I've had mine tell me that. Uh, so let's be an example. And one way we can be an example, let's be here tonight at 6 p.m. Let's be here on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. And, and let's be the example we should be, not to, not just to our, but for ourselves, for our, to it strengthen one another. Let's, let's, let's put our best foot forward and see if we can't accomplish that. Another thing, Cliff, who says it's going to be the good, the attractive women looking for you? That's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about that. But anyway, we want to thank our visitors for coming and welcome you back at any time. Brother Bumpers, if you close us in prayer. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, again, we come in prayer. Thank you, please. Thee for the Lord, this large day and all the many blessings we enjoy. We're thankful, Father, that this congregation meets here in Grosbeck. We're thankful for our church family. 
We're thankful for the message that brought, Cliff brought us this morning. We pray that we can use the, use the things he said in our everyday life and we'll be a better Christian in the future than we have been in the past. Our Father, we once again pray for so much needed and wanted rainfall for this area. It's terribly dry. We would certainly appreciate it if you could send some our way. We once again pray for our sick of our congregation. If it be thy will, return them, return them to their normal health. Our Father, we ask you be with this congregation and help them search out and find a, a, a good youth minister to help out and because the young people are the future of this congregation and we hope we can find a good one. Once again, we ask that you bless us. We're thankful for your son and life he lived. Once again, we ask you to forgive us of our sins in Christ's name. Amen.